Module 1, SQL Server Architecture. So, if you are new to SQL Server, you might be asking what is exactly SQL Server and what it does. Microsoft SQL Server is an RDBMS, or Relational Database Management System. It's available in the market just like competitors such as IBM DB2, Oracle and others. And these are the main purposes of a database system. Data storage, meaning that SQL Server will be capable of storing large amounts of critical data on tables. Security, data protection is always a priority, and data must be accessed on table, so security is always a concern. The backup ability, one of the core foundations on any database system. Performance, data not only should be accessible, but it should be done also in a very fast manner. And scalability, which is the capacity the software has to adapt itself to new workloads and absorb new features and components. Now, imagine you have a business, maybe a small retail store. Your application uses .NET or Java languages and require access to data that are on tables to perform basic operations. This is where SQL Server comes in. In this scenario, you will need a Windows Server to host a SQL Server instance, which is a copy of the SQL Server software, which will finally contain the databases where the tables are. This is a very simple example without any complexity, but it's just to give you an idea of how SQL Server works. Now, on this scenario, it adds a little bit of complexity to the scheme. Here, we have a high availability solution such as failover clustering on two nodes that are two ser different servers, where we may also have other solutions such as log shipping, database mirroring, or replication. Again, it is just to provide you an overview of the product capabilities, and this is just an example. There are many other possibilities. Microsoft SQL Server uses the Transact SQL as the primary language, which is a variation of the original structured query language created by IBM. While this course will not cover query techniques, it is good at least to be aware of, of the major aspects of the SQL. The DML represents data manipulation language composed by select, insert, delete and update statements. Then we have the data definition language for creating, altering or removing objects. The data control language used to grant or deny permissions to logins and users. And finally, transaction control language, which are the famous commit and rollback statements that controls the results of a transaction. Then, these are some examples of the main objects in a SQL Server instance. We have systems and user tables, systems and user databases, logins, roles, server or database level, schemas, and store procedures, view, trigger, and indexes. These are some of the most important tools used by the SQL Server DBA on a daily basis. So we have the SQL Server Management Studio, SQL Server Configuration Manager, the Event Viewer, Remote Desktop Connection, Performance Monitor, and the Windows PowerShell. These are just some examples. There are more tools depending on the industry you are working on or the type of your company. For example, you may have third-party softwares. On this slide, I wanted to show some important links that a DBA should be aware of. And I strongly recommend you to use these links after the end of the course to look for deeper contents. From white papers to video trainings, it's important for the DBA to know where to consult for correct information. The Books Online has a lot of useful documentation. TechNet forums, you have real-world problems where you can learn something from or even request help from other DBAs around the world. And there are many others such as SQL Server Customer Advisory Team Blogs, SQLSkills.com, SQL Server Central.com, Brent Oza, Red Gates, just to mention some. SQL Server Query Lifecycle Simplified. From this slide on, we will look into some of the internal aspects of SQL Server. If you have never seen this before, it might be confusing at first, due to the amount of terminology or concepts. So, what I recommend is, after watching the other modules and practicing them, return to this part, as it will be much easier to understand. Let's take a look now at the basic life cycle of a query in SQL Server. Breaking Bad fans will certainly recognize this guy here. 
he will represent our end user. So this user had ac has access to a device that could be a computer or smartphone and browse an online store for tablets and apply a filter. In this case, he wants the lowest price first. And then the result is displayed back to user and he can apply the decision to buy or not the product. This is a very simple example and now we're going to see what actually happens behind the scenes inside the SQL Server structure. So this is the SQL Server query lifecycle from an internal SQL Server perspective. Here we have our end user application to send a select statement to browse data. The command then will be encapsulated in some sort of package and will traverse in some layers until it reaches the SQL Server. It reaches the operating system, in this case the Windows Server, passes to the network firewall and the SQL Server network interface using TCP IP. So the command finally reaches SQL Server. Before that, it uses TDS, which is Tabular Data Stream, a protocol that interacts with database server. So once, once it has reached the SQL Server, it goes to the command parser. The command parser will make sure there are no errors in the code, such as an additional comma or a missing object. And it will check if this object already exists, like a table or index. Once it finishes this, it comes the access method, which is a collection of code responsible for data retrieval. The access method will check for an, ex an existing query plan and to do this, it has to go to the memory using the buffer manager that contains the buffer pool and finally reaches the plan cache. If it finds an existing plan, that is, if this query is known to SQL Server because it was executed before, it will send it back to the query optimizer so the plan can be used. If it doesn't exist, SQL, uh, the query optimizer will have to generate a new one Base it on statistics and other factors. So once the plan is generated for the query, comes the query executor, which name already says what it does. After this, the query executor will go again to the access method so that the required data pages can be read from memory because they are in the data cache, so they are retrieved from disk into memory. Or, if they are already in memory, they are just read and then the information is sent back to user using the same way it did before. There are two main engines in this whole operations. We're going to take a look of, uh, at those now. So the common parser, query optimizer and executor, these are part of the relational engine. And these other in green, they are part of the storage engine the next slides so we're going to see some more details about them. So the relational engine is composed by the common parser, query optimizer and executor. The common parser, as I said before, validates the syntax on the T-SQL being passed, meaning that if a query has any error, SQL Server will abort the whole transaction and will not move forward. The query optimizer plays an important role. It has the duty to generate an efficient query plan based on its cost which may vary according to, according to what information is available for processing, such as recently updated statistics. And a query executor, which is the name already says what it does, is responsible for processing the query and the CPU itself. So this image shows an example of a graphical representation of a query plan generated by the query optimizer. In summary, these are logical operations. And the storage engine is composed by the access methods, the buffer and transaction manager. The access method is a collection of code for data retrieval, as I said before, and the query lifecycle. The buffer manager contains the buffer pool, which is the main memory consumer and also the data and plan caches. And the transaction manager governs the log and lock manager. And these are in summary physical operations. Now you may be asking why we did not use it the lock and lock manager in the query lifecycle. That was because the query was a simple select statement so there was no data change at all. 
Next, we are going to view the definition of another key elements on SQL Server internal, data pages, write ahead logging, checkpoint and lazy writer. The data pages are the smallest unit where data is stored in SQL Server. Every data page has a fixed, si fixed size of 8 kbytes. So SQL Server maps data pages to extents, which are a collection of 8 contiguous data pages. An extent can be mixed or uniform, depending if it belongs to more than one object, and a collection of a certain number of extents form an allocation bitmap such as GAM, which is Global Allocation Map. And this image shows the body of a data page, where actual rows are kept, as well as some metadata, like page header information. The write ahead logging is a very interesting mechanism. It will ensure that all changes to the data pages has an associated record about that change in the transaction log before writing the changed data from memory to disk. This method it guarantees the durability property of the transactions, which is the ability to undo or roll back or roll forward any changes for the transactions if necessary. So if write-ahead logging didn't exist, SQL Server wouldn't be a reliable database platform. And this is another reason why the transaction log is so important, and we will talk more about it in Module 4. The checkpoint is a data synchronization mechanism. In SQL Server, every data page change is done in memory, not directly in disk, where the physical database, file, database files are. So SQL Server marks the changed data pages as dirty, and flushes them out to disk when the checkpoint occurs, so the information is synchronized with the log in physical files. The checkpoint happens every one minute by default, or it can be done manually by simply writing the checkpoint command. Additionally, it can occur in, on, in another circumstances, such as during log backups, or during the simple recovery models, which we will see in modules 4 and 5. The lazy writer plays an essential role and is another mechanism that shows how physical memory is essential to SQL Server operations. It will use the last recently used algorithm to determine when a data page was last accessed in memory. And depending on the result, it can decide to flush the page to disk to release free space in the buffer pool, or if the page was not accessed during that certain period it keeps it in memory because the page can be frequently used by another queries. Now let's take a look at the transaction acid properties. The acid properties are essential to be known by any DBAs. They represent key concepts around the transactions. Let's review each one now. The first one is atomicity. This property indicates that a transaction must be able to fully complete its operations to be able to succeed. Imagine that our transaction is an ATM withdrawal. Two things uh, must happen for this transaction to complete. First, the cash has to be withdrawn, and then a debit operation must take place on the account owner. If one of these operations fails, then the transaction cannot be completed. The consistency says that a transaction cannot complete if it violates data constraints or corrupt the table. Prat practical examples are if primary keys are violated due to duplicate values, an attempt to insert invalid data, or common log size exceeded during an insert operation. The isolation is about data concurrency. SQL Server has a mechanism to protect data such as locking and transaction isolation level. One classic example is when a transaction is doing an operation that modifies data, an exclusive lock is placed and all other users' uh, processes attempting to browse or update a table may have to wait until the original transaction is complete. And finally, the durability. Every transaction must be durable, that is, it must be written to the transaction log so it has the ability to roll back if necessary. Now that we've finished reviewing the internal components on SQL Server architecture, let's take a look at the versions and editions. These are the SQL Server versions currently in the market. SQL Server 7 is extremely rare, 
while the 2000 version not that much as still some legacy application runs on this platform. SQL Server 2005 to 2008 R2 are the majority in place nowadays, while the new family 2012 and 2014 are growing, and we have the SQL Server Azure, which is the platform optimized for the cloud. The most common additions in the are the Enterprise and Standard. The Enterprise is often seen in more critical environments, as this is the most, most complete edition and it has almost no limitations, while the Standard is cheaper but it has some drawbacks. If you want to know the technical specifications and limitations for each edition, the best place to look is the books online from Microsoft. So here are some of the characteristics of each version, starting with SQL Server 7 and 2000. Uh, SQL Server has been introduction, this version, the failover clustering, high availability feature, being able to support mission critical system, but has had some troubleshooting limitations at that time. The SQL Server 2005, 2008 and R2 offered a great expansion of functionalities and also introduction, the introduction, the DMVs, which are dynamic management views in SQL Server 2005. They, these are great for troubleshooting purposes as many internal data was not available on the previous versions on SQL Server 2000. It also introduced the SQL Server Management Studio, which was the evolution of the Query Analyzer, the main interface used by the DBAs. And finally, the new family, the new generation of the product, SQL Server 2012 and 2014, uh, it offers the always-on high availability feature, in-memory processing, column store index, and its cloud-ready platform. These are some of the other features available in SQL Server, such as the analyzer services for data warehousing, reporting services, and integration services. These features, they are selected during the product installation, but are out of the scope for this course. Now let's take a look at our first demo named First Steps with SQL Server. If you are already familiar with SQL Server, or if you are already a DBA, you might want to skip this slide. I will demonstrate some of the very basics of SQL Server for those who haven't seen it yet. So this is a Windows 7 environment as I will use it as, as a test lab for the course. I am accessing now the SQL Server Configuration Manager to verify the active services. In this case, here is my SQL Server instance named SQL Trainee, the SQL Server Agent and the browser. You can see the state, both are running. The start mode manual, meaning that the SQL Server will only start when I issue a command to the console or to the interface. The logon as, which is with account from Windows, is controlling the SQL Server instance. In this case, Nick is the account name that is use, using it. So we can ob observe here the state, the start mode, the service account, and if I right click here, I can enter the commands. I can check on properties. As you can see, this is the service account being used. It's a local Windows account, or I could use the built in account, which is not recommended but still works. Here's the service mentioned which binary pad the SQL Server installation was located. My computer name, which is in this case Nick PC, SQL Server name, the process ID on Windows, the start mode. Here I can change it, I can disable, set to automatic, which is start with the windows and disable, current state. The startup parameter is at a more advanced setting that we will not check now. This is used during troubleshooting on critical situations. Sometimes we need to start SQL Server with less resources to use less memory or to start in a single user, but it's just for your awareness. But for now, it's OK just to view these options. I'm going to hit Cancel. Here we can also have the client configuration. You can see actually the client configuration, the protocols, configure TCP IP ports. But I just wanted to show you this interface, which is more recommended 
then if you use the standard services.msc console from Windows because this configuration manager it only lists the services that belongs to SQL Server not other services from Windows so you have less chance to do to commit any error when dealing with this interface now I'm going to show you the SQL Server Management Studio this is the initial screen that we, you will be prompted to choose the Windows or SQL Server authentication mode here we have the computer name in this case Nick PC and I'm choosing Windows authentication here is my SQL Server instance name SQL Training and I'll just hit connect so this is the object explorer I'm going to expand a little bit here to the right where you can also see here it's my user currently login that is Nick Nick PC is the computer name the Windows name and here is the product version 11.0.3000 that is SQL Server 2012 with Service Pack 1 this might look very simple but is useful when you are working with several instances at the same time and connecting with different users so you can actually see the Service Pack version or the SQL Server version when dealing with multiple servers at the same time. These are the system databases which will be covered in Module 4, Master, Model, MSDB and TimpDB. Now if we hit New Query you can observe this tab here already shows my session number which is 57 there's another tab open 51 I'm going to close it for now. If we click on View Properties window it also shows the same information it's very basic stuff but for the beginners this is very useful for you to situate on SQL Server like in which instance you are running the command what is your SPID, the server process ID, the SQL Server version and this information I have already told you the username you are connected, Windows name and SQL Server instance name. This option in the drop box here is used to change the contest of the database of your current session. So notice we were in master database and here I can change like for msdb or tmtb. So the commands I entered here on this part on this query they will be targeted to the database that is specified here. I can do this using this drop box or by command which we are going to see on the next exercise. So let me close this properties window here and let me open the exercise on this new session. I'm going to close the 52 one. So if I try to give this command here, select star from dbo.backupset which is a system database, it's going to say it invalid object name because this table only exists on the MSDB database. You can change it from here or using this command below. Use MSDB Go will change the context of my current session to the MSDB database. Now the select will work. This is the result of a metadata table that contains backup information. It's not relevant to see these columns right now. So let me erase this stuff here and continue the exercise. I'm going to go back to the master contest, use master go and let me select the following information from the sys.databases table from the master database and hit execute. Notice that I'm only running the code that I selected here which is highlighted in yellow. If I just click here outside and hit, ex hit execute it's going to execute whatever it's written down here. So I don't want this. I just want this piece of code. I'm going to select execute and it will work. This is a simple display from some standard options for this, all the, the databases, system and user databases existing on my SQL Server. I just wanted to give you a sample of a simple transact SQL query. Now I'm going to open a transaction explicitly with begin trend command. I'm going to hit execute. I'm going to use tempdb to create a temporary table name it movies let me expand this there we go create table 
movies with three columns there we go and I'm going to load some data into movies three movies gladiator dark knight and predator as well as the movie year there we go three rows affected and now I'm going to browse the data I have just inserted notice I am on TempTB contest which is where the temporary table was created so I just selected this piece of code and this in green it's a comment so whatever I write here it's not going to be executed so we have the movie code movie name and launch here and I'm going to update the data by correcting one in small information here the movie predator it's not from 1950 it's from 1987 so here is the update one row affected I'm going to browse the data again just this piece of code I can include another comment it makes no difference in the result so here it is I'm ordering by movie year so we have the predator gladiator and dark knight and then I'm going to commit this transaction I could commit or roll back so I'm going to just commit transaction it works if I try to commit it again SQL Server will tell me there is no corresponding open transaction with this request so this commit transaction request has no corresponding begin transaction so this is very basic stuff but I w wanted to show you that so if you are not aware of how SQL Server works the main interface that the DBA uses this is the SQL Server Management Studio and these were some very simple commands where we browsed information from the sys databases and created temporary object that is a table here and inserted and updated data inside of a transaction let's proceed now to the next module